Okay, so I think there'll be um, quite a lot of resonances between um, uh, this paper mix that I'm going to read out and what Tara's been talking about, particularly in relation to the, the location where the work was happening and um, women's roles. I've been asked to start by playing a sound clip of um, six minutes, so I'm just going to do that and, and time it and then I'll, I'll read out next paper. Imagination got me through this time. 
I called that place Idleworld after the wee den that Anna and Diana used to play in, in Anna Green Gables. And that house was very basic, but it was home to me. And I loved it. lasted a year or more and the performances took place over a month, it seems some kind of distant dream now. My whole life revolved around this project for at least 12 months, but it feels now a watery mirage of something impossible to grasp, hold on to, quantify or even describe. I'm really enjoying this quality. The performance came and went with the moon, the tide, the weather, a birthday, a memory. Now it's like a ripple, a ripple or an echo, fading slightly with each palimpsest. I wonder how I'll remember it a year from now, maybe like looking at a reflection in water. Voice on granite, metal on metal, rain on plastic, wind on water, speech on song. These are lasting. Part one. Good morning everyone, my name's Nick Green and, and I'm an artist based here in Glasgow. I make all kinds of work with all sorts of people. Sometimes my work resides in theatres or performance spaces and at other times responds to site, place, materials or natural systems. However, thing, however everything I make celebrates the possibilities of liveness. In my work where possible, I try to meet with and respond to the context I find myself within, rather than laying preconceived ideas or, of outcomes upon people, place or environment. In the past, I've made many invitations for participation in the work. In one piece, I encouraged women from all walks of life to dance wildly together naked. Over 1,000 women have performed this work with me across the world. Collaboration and listening is at the centre of my of the centre of process I engage in, in best, which is why I feel the forms of my work are often varied. Approaching new work, I try to ask, what does this place, these people, this context want me to do me to do? Rather than approaching it with the question, what will I do here? For me, this is an important distinction. It's not that I feel I, I must um, do what others want of me more than I choose to listen for the work, noticing pattern, meaning, energy, as it emerges through relationships. For me, collaboration is also a process of unknowing, so I might open myself to the possibilities of what I might learn. I love this Pauline Oliveira's quote, walk so silently that the bottom of your feet become ears. As mentioned, as well as my work for theatre or designate designated performance spaces. That's the woman dancing wildly. Okay. Um, as mentioned, as well as my work for theatre or designated performance spaces, I also make work for non-theatre spaces. I've made artworks for woodlands across northern Europe, for outdoor sculpture parks, for cricket grounds, for city farms, for the length of the River Thames, for corridors and for disused, dis, disused docklands. Today, today I'm meant to be talking about public art and heritage. But first, a reflection on public art. As a performance maker, I find the idea of public art being somehow special or different from any other art I make a little strange. For me, performance only becomes performance when it becomes public. It has to meet with its context to become itself, so it's all public to me. Heiner Goebbels says, I like performance as it's a social art form. It's social in its making and it's social in its delivery. And I agree. Sometimes I find that the use of the term public when used in relation to art practices somehow excludes the artists themselves from the public for which the art is intended and the artists themselves for which art is intended, and I don't feel comfortable with this division. In fact, I think it's a problem. Aside from the ethical implications, I personally do not want a life where I might be knowingly othered from the people I work with by my own design. 
That's definitely not why I became an artist working in performance. I think for me, a sense of public art is part of my definition of art. So it would be like saying creative art or artistic art or something like this. <clears throat> In other circumstances, I've felt some publics have been considered as more public than others. Are the people seeing my work in the theatre less of the public than the people happening upon it outside the theatre? Different work engages different audiences in different ways, yes. But I feel these instances nod to a kind of privileging of the artist over others who don't, do not identify as artists, which I feel uncomfortable with. So I probably won't use the phrase public art very much in relation to what I do. Part two. I was invited here to discuss a project presented earlier this year called Turn, created for the government moving dogs. <clears throat> Here's a bit of background. For those of you who haven't visited the docks, there are three oval-shaped stepped granite basins slightly to the east of Govan Centre on the south bank of the river. They are of course a remnant from Govan and Glasgow's shipbuilding Haiti and have as yet avoided development. They've been disused by the shipbuilding industry for over 40 years and have in that time been looted, graffitied, become rewilded, stripped and rewilded again. They have been a favourite spot for photographers, daytime drinkers, dog walkers, swimmers, rather than the knee, and a recreation spot for the young people of the area. My experience is that the feelings locals have towards the docks are varied. Many that live close by in the neighbouring housing find it to be a regular spot for troublesome action, which they could do without. Others seem to have a tangible sense of pride associated with the docks, and many would have them restored as a heritage museum. In a more general sense, over the 16 years I've lived in Glasgow, I've noticed, I've noticed how little or rarely the river is generally accessed or enjoyed. When it comes to the Clyde, over the years I've been more readily reminded of it, of an industry's death, rather than a river's life. I continue to be surprised by how an ecological life force such as the river is so strongly associated with industrial or economic contribution, or lack of. I wonder when it comes to the river and thinking forward, whether there might be a kind of black spot of acute sensitivity which makes it tricky to reimagine relationships. Maybe it's like a bruise that doesn't fade. This could be due to, fraught, to a fraught history of work and worklessness, which still causes painful and turbulent ripples, even in second and third generation shipbuilding communities. Perhaps there is a sense of loss associated with our river, which just makes it too difficult to enjoy, appreciate, or transform environmental relationships. There's pride in it, that's for certain, but it seems in my experience to be retrospective rather than current. For me, this brings up questions about heritage. Heritage, heritage is the passing on of ownership or legacy. I assume most people think of this as a positive thing, but of course, some associations are much more complex and turbulent. The geography and sociology of our river city is undeniably tangled with notions of economics, class, and symbolically with gender. And I turn to the late Doris Lessing to remind that spaces and places are not only gendered, but in their being so, both reflect and affect the ways in which gender is constructed and understood. Another issue here is how much, how much heritage is more loudly revered than others. I suppose I would ask how much this has a hold on identities, patterns and associations of place and people, and how much a sense of looking back might make of moving forward difficult. I wanted to respond to all of this, and so slowly I created Turn with a number of other artists and collaborators. Turn begins in recognition of natural cycles and transitions that surround, form and influence our lives and marks interactions of turnings on many scales. Part three. Oops. So 
sorry, I, I didn't know where the slides fitted in. Um, the Turner performances took place last September, coinciding with the new moon, the full moon, and the last day of the lunar cycle, within one lunar month. All the performances coincided with the low turning tide. I wanted to begin with something bigger than the narratives of a human industrial past, instead considering the continuing ecological heritages of the river and its wild systems. As part of the performance, the performance we heard the voices of women celebrating their birthdays who, over the course of an hour, described the turnings of their own lives. Earlier you heard Colette, born on the 16th of September, performing her birthday, a full moon. The women's voices were broadcast live on site over a local radio frequency within the dock and listened to intimately, intimately by audiences through these little speaker boxes. Their voices were accompanied by a choral score performed live and amplified from within the belly of the dock. Women on their birthday in the dock coinciding with lunar and tidal turnings, a temporal artwork. A response to the anthropocentric, masculine privileging of certain heritage. Maybe it's a kind of anti-heritage or an alternative heritaging. The choir also rang bells which were created specially for the performance, each dedicated to a local organisation or individual, with an inscription of their choice. Using architectural acoustics, we were able to reflect and bounce vocals on the sound of bells, creating echoes and resonances. I considered the use of bells and creation of them in, a, in the community as both a memory of a past sound world, the hammering on metal hulls, and a gesture of movement or an in invitation for reimagining the potential of place and space. I came to think of dock number three, where a turn took place, as a kind of giant mouth, offering something abstract and ever-changing in a transitioning, shifting landscape. What if we can complexify the associations made with this space? What if we can unfix what we think we know? What if we can hear other alternative narratives to the ones we are used to, bouncing off the granite? How might that, how might that change our sense of place and possibility? The, place, the space is alive. I'm drawn to bells as in themselves they have a cultural quality of transition and for centuries we have used them to mark changes or turning points. As all the notions of pastness in this work, the accounts of past lives lived, the metal on metal echoes in a disused dock, is only ever for the purpose of creating a sense of nowness. A birthday, indeed any marking of a cycle of time, is a day when we often use we often use to reflect on the past, to move, move forward and make change. Actually, many of the women discuss the difficulties of their past, the struggle and tragedy of their lived experience. For me, this was not an attempt at nostalgia or the kind of reminiscence project I may have seen performed in the past. It doesn't make sense to me to always look behind as at a, a time that was better than now, and to believe that that, that sense of better that sense of what's better is lost, gone <coughs> over. Nor would I wish some aspects of past to last or be immortalised. Well, that's in the King of the Bells. <coughs> Epilogue. I began this project with ideas of transition, transformation and potential and ended with a system of performance presenting qualities of change and impermanence. There's no trace of the events left on site now, only recordings, photographs and testimonies of its having happened. Today I have questions about how ideas of heritage interact temporal art forms. Is it okay for public art to disappear? How as artists can we be less divisive when considering the public facing aspects of our work? I'm resisting quantifying, summarising or writing with a sense of completion here. It just doesn't feel right to refer to turn as fixed or finished. Much of the art I make remains a mysterious piece, something difficult to quantify in other languages, so I won't try here. In fact, I will actively avoid it. 
but perhaps the images and sounds of the work can do a better job of presenting the gentle traces and watery echoes of the work. I know you're supposed to feed them seeds, but all we had was broken biscuits and bread, so that was what we fed them. And at night we fed the fox. And the nurses would tell us off, but we didn't mind. Peter was so kind to me. And it was great to have a bodyguard. And in some ways he actually resembled my husband physically, so in a way it was good. I could talk to him about stuff and I feel like I actually got over some of that stuff. One day I decided that I would like to dance in this hospital and I asked the nurse. I saw there was a spare room and I saw there was a tape recorder and I said, can I go and dance in the room? I'm a dancer, you know. And you know, I think that would be really good for me. I, you know, I express myself really well through dance and I'm sure it would help me get better. And he says to me, people would think you're mad. I said, what do you, what do you think people think? They wouldn't let me dance. When I imagine my future, there's very little I would like to change. I love being on my own, looking after my two girls. I just appreciate where I am right now. That's all. Thank you.